Our final talk this afternoon and for the day is from Bishop Robert Barron, very well known to all of us. He's the Auxiliary Bishop of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, one of the Archdiocese's Auxiliaries. And Bishop Barron is going to speak with us this evening on Pope Francis and Vatican II. Well, special greetings to all my friends at the Napa Institute. Thanks so much for inviting me to address you today. You know, I want to talk about something which, I'll be honest with you, has really been bugging me recently. Something that I think is a real disturbance in the life of the church. And that is this increasingly vocal attack on the Second Vatican Council. Um, I tend a lot, you know, to the social media. And you'll see in social media a lot of very strong voices that are articulating not, not a, a questioning of how the council is implemented but a questioning of the council itself. And this cuts against the very integrity of the church. I'm especially concerned because in the social media world, young minds are being very specially formed. I find that uh, often when I move around the Catholic world, older Catholics don't quite sense the importance of social media. Trust me, especially with younger Catholics, they're paying very close attention to it and they're hearing voices attacking the council. Now, with that distinction in mind between the council itself and the implementation, let me share this with you. Uh, I didn't have to read in books. I lived through it. The strange and inadequate way in which the council was implemented and received, certainly in our country. Uh, I remember vividly when I was coming of age, so go back to the late 60s and throughout the 70s of the last century, I remember doctrinal drift I remember a church at war with itself, largely over questions of authority and sexuality. Uh, I remember wild liturgical experimentation. Yes, even a priest in full vestments coming up the aisle for mass on a motorcycle. I remember that when I was a kid. The general feeling of malaise, I'll put it that way. That was a term used in the political life often in the 70s. I think it applied in some ways too to the church. So I get it. In fact, I cut my teeth as a writer, as a critic of the implementation of the council in our country. One of the first articles I ever published was called Beige Catholicism. I was complaining about the Catholicism of my youth. Beige had lost its color, its distinctiveness. It had become in some ways just an echo of the environing culture. So I'm with those who raise questions about the implementation. You know, just a, a side note here. Um, one of the great privileges of my life was the opportunity for about five years to live at least part-time with uh, Cardinal George. I lived with him as I was doing my work in um, evangelization. So I had the opportunity, oh, once or maybe twice a week to have dinner with him. And dinner with Cardinal George was an extraordinary privilege. He loved, if he didn't have appointments in the evening, just to stay for a couple hours. And I always tried to get him talking about ideas because you know his day was so filled up with practical administration. He loved talking about books and ideas. I remember in one of these marvelous conversations, he commented, and I don't think he ever published this, that the death of Cardinal Meyer of Chicago was a disaster for the American church. Now, here's why. Albert Cardinal Meyer, right, Archbishop of Chicago from the late 50s into the 60s, present at Vatican II, himself trained as a scripture scholar, professor of scripture for many years, I believe he was even a president of one of the last sessions of the council. Someone that knew Vatican II from the inside, understood it deeply. Cardinal Meyer came home from the council in 1965. And I talked when I was a young priest to some of the old timers that remembered this. He invited all the priests of Chicago. I think in those days it probably was about 1,500 men. He addressed them. He spoke of the council, what it meant, how it should be implemented. They gave him a standing ovation. And then six months later, he died. And Cardinal George said, I think quite um, uh, insightfully, that the death of Meyer 
prevented in many ways a healthy and integrated implementation of the council. Meyer could have done, he thought, what Wojtyla did in Krakow after Vatican II, where he led his people through a careful reading of the council. So Karl George thought that was one reason why the implementation was a little bit uh, shaky. So in regard to that, I get it. I can sympathize. But with attacks on the council itself, no way. No way. Now we've crossed a quantum. Friends, there simply is no authority in the church higher than that of an ecumenical council summoned by and presided over by the successor of Peter. There's no higher authority in the church. Therefore, to say that the documents of Vatican II are fatally flawed, heretical, the product of nefarious infiltrations of enemies of the church, even susceptible to cherry-picking on the part of critical commentators. And you can find all of that, trust me, in very influential social media. To say any of that is simply inimical to the integrity of the church Catholic. You know, I have to admit, sometimes I just I shake my head in kind of amusement when I see some of these attempts to justify the opposition to Vatican II. Some say, for example, well, look, Vatican II was a pastoral council, not a doctrinal council. Nonsense. Doctrinal issues. Think of the nature of the church, the human person, the moral life, sacraments, nature of the priesthood and episcopacy, meaning of the liturgy, the social doctrine of the church. All of that is doctrinal matter, and it runs right through the documents of Vatican II. Moreover, even if we admit, and I will happily admit it, that the overall purpose of Vatican II was indeed very pastoral, that says nothing against its authority, against the integrity and authority of its documents. I, again, just shake my head in disbelief when I, I hear and read things like this. Oh, you know, I, I, I like 85% of Vatican II. It's just that pesky 15% I'm uneasy with. Well, my response is, well, what percentage of Trent do you accept? 70? Just that pesky 30% of Trent I'm not crazy about. How about Chalcedon? 65% of Chalcedon's okay? How about the Nicene Creed? Oh, yeah, well, 90% of that I think is just great. It's just 10% I'm uneasy with. You know, friends, at the risk of sounding unecumenical, there's a name for that process. It's Protestantism. If you, if you arrogate to yourself the prerogative of determining how much of, a Vatic, of an ecumenical council you're going to accept, well, that's just private judgment. And it leads to the vociferous division of the church. That's what's bugging me about these attacks on Vatican II. You know, here's something that has been striking me a lot. You go back to the early 1970s, when the uh, communal group of theologians, think here of Ratzinger, de Lubach, uh, Balthazar, others, broke with the concilium theologians. They gave three reasons for the break, and I'll just look at one of them, because I think it applies today. One of the reasons was, they worried that the concilium theologians wanted to perpetuate the spirit of the Vatican Council. Now, all the people that founded Communio were conciliar people, but they said, no, no, you don't want to perpetuate a council. Now, why, why? From time to time in its history, in fact, just 20 times in 2,000 years, the church has seen fit to pause, to put its life, if you want, into a kind of suspense and determine some great question. But then, happily, it turns from the council to get back to its basic work. And so the, the founders of Communio said, we don't want a perpetual council. That's a church constantly debating constantly wondering what it's about, wringing its hands all the time. No, no, we settled something at Vatican II, and now let's get to the work of Communio, hence the title of their uh, magazine. Well, in the 70s, they meant that against the left. But see, I think it applies very much today, but against the extreme right. I see this all the time in the social media. Bishop, isn't it time to reopen these questions of Vatican II? Shouldn't we reconsider in light of the last, you know, 50, 60 years? <laughs> My answer is no. We don't want to perpetuate the council. The council is settled teaching according to the ecclesiology of the church. It's not time to reopen the questions of Vatican II. It's to get on with the great work of Vatican II. 
That's my concern. Okay, what was the great work of Vatican II? What was the purpose of it? Now, now don't worry. I know you've, you've sat through probably a hundred presentations on the documents of Vatican II. All I want to do is share what I think is the main thematic trajectory of the Council, if you want the hermeneutical key to reading all the conciliar documents. And again, I'll go back to um, my mentor, Cardinal George. Another one of his uh, table uh, conversations, he said, Vatican II was primarily a missionary council. Vatican II was primarily a missionary council. And keep in mind, Cardinal George was a member of the Oblates of Mary Immaculate, a missionary congregation. His study in theology was in the area of missiology. He knew what he was talking about when he said Vatican II was a missionary council. You know, interesting too with Cardinal George in my mind, his theological doctorate was in missiology. His philosophical doctorate was in American philosophy. He read, did a, a paper on Josiah Royce, who was American Hegelian. He was a colleague of William James, would have known Dewey and those people. When I first learned that, I said to him, oh, your eminence, I, I didn't realize that you were Hegelian. <laughs> I remember he reacted sort of with horror. He said, no, no, I received an inoculation. <laughs> I received enough of Hegel so that I was inoculated against him. But my point here is Cardinal George philosophically knew the culture that he wanted to evangelize. He knew the American culture. And in his theological doctorate, he knew the great missionary purpose of the church, to go forth into that culture to evangelize. That's how he read Vatican II, I think quite correctly. Now let me just fill in this uh, picture a little bit by going back to a, a small text, but a very influential one, from 1952 by Hans Urs von Balthasar, a little book called in his German Schleifung der Bastionen. Uh, that means raising of the bastions. Now, not R-A-I-S-I-N-G, but rather R-A-Z-I-N-G. Knocking down the bastions. Now, what's his argument in that book? His argument was the church of his time, he felt, was crouching too defensively behind its high medieval walls. It was filled with spiritual and theological treasures, but it was becoming incapable of sharing those treasures effectively with the modern culture. And therefore, it's time, he thought, to raise, to knock down those bastions, to let the life out. Now, it's very important here. It's a very important distinction. Balthazar, as you know, was one of the great critics of modernity. I mean, he's no one-sided advocate of, of modern culture, modern philosophy. In fact, he was very critical of it. The project was not, oh, let's let the modern world come rushing in through those broken walls. No, no. The idea was to let the life of the church out through those walls now into the world. Biblical image, Noah's Ark. On this ark, there's a microcosm of God's good creation in the midst of chaos. But the minute the ark comes to rest, open the windows, open the doors, and let the life out. That was Balthazar's reading of the Noah's Ark of the Church, circa 1952, so at the, at the uh, heart of, of Pius XII's papacy. He felt it's time for us to open the doors to let the life out. You know, Balthazar himself wasn't at the council, a lot of complicated reasons for that, but a lot of his avatars were. I mean, think of uh, Ratzinger, Deluba, Congar, Wojtyla, many others who carried this vision, I think, very much into the council. Now, relatedly, there's a famous photograph of St. Pope John XXIII. It was at a press conference he gave at the beginning when he announced the council. He's standing next to this giant globe. And at that press conference, he uses for the first time a phrase that became the title of arguably the most important of the conciliar documents, namely, Lumen Gentium right? The light of the nations. What did John XXIII see? The mission of the church is to bring the lumen to the gentis. So some read the document Lumen Gentium, which indeed is on the church, and they say, oh, the lumen means the church. No, no. The lumen, the light, is Christ. I'm the light of the world. The church's job is to bring that lumen to the gentis, to go out now to all the world with the gospel. 
That's how John the 23rd, I think, saw it. Apply this now to the laity. The universal call to holiness. How did the laity become holy? Precisely by being themselves agents of evangelization. Agents of the sanctification of the world. And so we know that from the conciliar documents. What's the old cliche? You know, the laity are there to pay, pray, and obey. Well, Vatican II said, absolutely not. The laity are there to bring, in their own way, the lumen to the gentes. By being great Catholic lawyers, great Catholic politicians, great Catholic journalists and writers, great Catholic business leaders, great Catholic teachers, investors, bankers, parents, etc. And not incidentally so, but substantially so. That's the universal call to holiness. The whole church is the bearer of the lumen to the gentes. We knock down the bastions to let the life out. Think of all those areas of life I've just described. The purpose is, is not to leave them in their secularity. It's to transfigure their secularity and to bring Christ to that realm. Now again, if I can quote Cardinal George, the purpose of the council, the Pache, many of its post-conciliar interpreters, was not to modernize the church. Rather, it was to Christify the world. If you forget my entire talk, but remember that, I'd be happy. The purpose of the council was not to modernize the church. Though Cardinal George said some modernization was required in order to uh, allow it to achieve its mission. But its mission was to Christify the world. See, I think everybody, once we see that, all the council documents open up. That's the hermeneutical key. Once we get that principle, then we see what? Liturgy, sacraments, episcopacy, priesthood, laity, ecumenical conversation, scriptural revival, all of it has a missionary purpose. The church that goes out. You know, if Lumen Gentium is the greatest, uh, some will say maybe the second most important is Gaudium et Spes, which is the church in the modern world. And again, I, I know my generation largely got the message, oh, that means the church should modernize itself. No, watch. The church in the modern world. The church going out into that world to change it, transfigure it. That's what Vatican II was about. Now, St. Paul Paul VI, who brought the council to a successful completion, just 10 years after the close of the council, publishes Evangelii Nunciandi, the great text on evangelization, in some ways the, the master text of the new evangelization. Famously, he says there, the church doesn't have a mission. The church is a mission. Again, that's an interpretive key, everybody. Once we see that, Everything in the church is geared toward bringing the lumen to the Gentiles. You know, I've done that both at the parish level and now at, at the diocesan level, is to ask everyone involved in the church, no matter what group you're meeting with, how are you bringing the lumen to the Gentiles? That's what we're all about. Whether you're, you're a liturgy person, you're a social justice person, you're working with kids, you're working with the elderly, whatever it is, how are you bringing the lumen to the Gentiles? That's what the church is all about. Now, of course, at that synod, which helped to produce Evangelii Nunciandi, 1975, there was this young cardinal from Krakow, Karl Wojtyla, who had been at Vatican II, helped to compose some of its major documents. As I said, helped to implement the documents in his home diocese. He becomes Pope in 1978, just three years later. What does he make? fundamental to his teaching and his pastoral activity, but the new evangelization. New in ardor, new in method, new in expression. What's old about it? Well, the, the lumen <laughs> Christi, the light of Christ, that's what we always bring. But now in a new and fresh way, having raised the bastions, having brought the life of the church out, we announce it to the world. There's John Paul II. You know, uh, that wonderful motto of his, uh, Duke in Altum, out into the depths. Um, when I was rector at Mundelein many years ago now, um, I redid our, our house chapel, the chapel for the students, as the John Paul II chapel because he had just been uh, beatified and, and canonized. And I put that motto up there for all the students to see, I hope now for the foreseeable future, 
Duke and Alton, out into the depths. You know, harbor is a safe place, but ships aren't meant for harbors. The church can stay in its harbor. It can stay behind its walls. It's not meant for that, though. It's meant to go out, Duke and Alton. Okay, so the questioning of Vatican II, the implementation versus the council itself, the purpose of the council. Now I want to say a few words about Pope Francis. How does all this relate to our present Holy Father? And you know, you don't need me to tell you this, but uh, the attacks on Vatican II, yeah, but also attacks on him. Attacks on, on Pope Francis, which I think are, are you know, unjustified. And when we see his pastoral work and magisterium in relation to what I've been talking about, I think we see how this makes sense. Obviously, Pope Francis was not himself a man at the council, like uh, you know, Paul VI or, or Karol Wojtyla. But in his bones, he's a man of the council. You know, he personally canonized, think about this, the three major players at, at Vatican II, uh, St. Pope John XXIII, St. Pope Paul VI, St. John Paul II. He, was, he personally canonized. I had the privilege of being present uh, for all three of those canonizations. Two, I was doing some um, news coverage. The third, I was, for Paul VI, I was there for the Youth Synod. But the three major players of Vatican II, Pope Francis uh, canonizes. I think it's fair to say, the one he identifies with the most is St. Pope Paul VI. I've heard the Pope Francis say this a number of times. He thinks the greatest teaching document after the Council was Evangelii Nunciandi the greatest, most influential of the teaching documents. So let's look at him now in light of these Vatican II themes. I might begin with the speech that Cardinal Jorge Mario Bergoglio gave at the General Congregation of Cardinals prior to the Conclave of 2013. So remember the Cardinals all gather prior to the Conclave and they give speeches, laying out their vision of the Church and what they think the next Pope should be like. Most commentators agree that the talk Bergoglio gave got him elected Pope. He spoke in that uh, presentation of a church that must go out from itself to the peripherias, as he famously said, to the peripheries. One thing I love is he specified not just the economic and political peripheries, but to what he called the existential peripheries. That means those who are alienated from God, those who've lost the sense of purpose and meaning. See, I think, especially in our country, God knows we have people on the economic and political peripheries, but we also have armies of people. I deal with them every day, especially young people, on the existential peripheries. What's the church's task? Go right back to Balthazar, raising the bastions. Break out from your own walls. Go out into the world. And indeed, Francis is saying, all the way to the peripheries to bring the lumen Christi. He also said in that famous presentation, a self-referential church becomes sick. And he's repeated that in many homilies and presentations since. He also, I love this, uh, gave a completely new spin to the famous scene in the book of Revelation where Jesus is knocking on the door, you know, and so, you know, open the door and let him in and he'll have supper with you. Bergoglio said, yeah, okay, that's a legitimate way to read it. But he said, I wonder at times if Jesus isn't knocking at the door to be let out. <laughs> so he's, he's stuck behind the walls, behind the door, and what he wants is to get out into the world. Here's a quote now from that address. This is from Bergoglio. Thinking of the next Pope, he must be a man who, from the contemplation and adoration of Jesus Christ, helps the church to go out to the existential peripheries, that helps her to be the fruitful mother who gains life from the sweet and comforting joy of evangelizing. I mean, do you want his program? He laid it out. In that, uh, in that statement. Now, once he's elected Pope, uh, he continues, of course, with this motif. 
Here's one I love from a chrism mass, an address to priests on, on chrism day. He said, think of the oil of your ordination, but running down your head onto your garment, but then running all the way to the fringe of your garment, the fringe of your vestment, that it might now go out to the world. Clericalism, he said, this is, I think, a great way to characterize it, is when the oil of your own ordination, the oil of your consecration, becomes rancid because it doesn't flow out from you to the world. That's what a priest is supposed to be. That's Vatican II's vision of the priest or the bishop. I think the clearest indication of Pope Francis' continuity to Vatican II is uh, in this document already referenced, Evangelii Gaudium. You know, I was with um, my brothers from the uh, California Episcopate, and just before the COVID thing struck, we were in Rome for the Ad Limina visit, and uh, we had an extraordinary three-hour visit with the Pope. We were all there in a, a large, you know, room, and the Pope came in and entertained our questions for three hours. But I heard this directly from him, that the interpretive key to his papacy and his teaching is Evangelii Gaudium his document on evangelization. You know, and of course, popes are always attentive to the titles of their encyclicals. So, Evangelii Gaudium, I think, very cleverly references, first of all, Evangelii Nunciandi of Paul VI, but also Gaudium et Spes. Evangelii Gaudium is trying to sum up what the conciliar and post-conciliar Elan was all about. So, I want to read you just a few passages from Evangelii Gaudium that I think hit this Vatican II theme so powerfully. Here's the first one from paragraph 20. The Word of God constantly shows us how God challenges those who believe in Him to go forth. Here's something in paragraph 24. The church which goes forth is a community of missionary disciples who bear fruit and rejoice. How about this application of Sacrosanctum Concilium, the statement of Vatican II on the liturgy? Francis says, The Church evangelizes and is herself evangelized through the beauty of the liturgy, which is both a celebration of the task of evangelization and the source of her renewed self-giving. This is lovely because the Pope here is citing a, um, a passage from John Paul II. But how... Franciscan this sounds. How like Pope Francis. Listen. All renewal in the church must have mission as its goal if it is not to fall prey to a kind of ecclesial introversion. Again, that's John Paul too. That isn't Francis, but Francis cites it with obvious enthusiasm. That's paragraph 27. How about this from paragraph 46? A church which goes forth is a church whose doors are open, going out to others in order to reach the fringes of humanity. Schleifung der Bastionen, <laughs> raising the bastions, opening the doors, knocking down the walls to let the life out. That's the theme. How about this from paragraph 49? And he said he often shared the same sentiment with the priests of Buenos Aires. I prefer a church which is bruised, hurting, and dirty because it's been out on the streets rather than a church which is unhealthy from being confined and from clinging to its own security. Can you hear Balthazar again there? Crouching defensively behind its walls. He'd rather a church that's gone out through those broken walls into the world. And just one more. But again, once you see this, read that document and it just begins to sing to you the whole way through. Just one more. In virtue of their baptism, all members of the people of God have become missionary disciples. All the baptized, whatever their position or their level of instruction in the faith, are agents of evangelization. The new evangelization calls for personal involvement on the part of each of the baptized. So, what are we waiting for? <laughs> what indeed? He's reiterating the great ecclesiology of Lumen Gentium which goes right back to John the 23rd. Could I encourage you, everybody, maybe reread Pope Francis. Go back over 
uh, Laudato Si, Amoris Letitia, Misericordiae Votos, Lumen Fidei, go through his teaching documents with this in mind, because he said it directly and personally, the key to understand my teaching is Evangelii Gaudium. Okay, can I try to bring this now to a close? I want to just give you a little coda to the talk. So I've sort of made the main point about Vatican II, about its relation to Francis. But here's a little coda about Francis' own uh, intellectual formation. You know, I follow uh, Tracy Rowland and others, too, in seeing this kind of um, scenario. Prior to the Council, you've got a Renian theological vision. Call it, if you want, a neo-Thomist or neo-scholastic, associated with a figure like uh, Reginald Garigou Lagrange. Now, now, please don't get me wrong. I like Garigou Lagrange. I got lots of his books. I, I, I reverence him. But he represented a sort of older form of Thomism. At the official level of the Council, probably like a Cardinal Ottaviani would have represented this, this neo-scholastic view. Well, I think it's fair to say that their voices were indeed heard in the period prior to the Council. Think of all the preliminary schemata that were presented to John the Twenty-Third. They came out of this uh, kind of classical neo-scholastic tradition, and they were, they were rejected. And after the great debates of the Council, that point of view was defeated, I think it's fair to say. It's very instructive to attend to the vote totals of the Vatican II documents. You know what the closest vote was? It was on the uh, document Dignitatis Humanae on religious liberty. Here was the vote total for that one. 2,308 to 70. And mind you, that was the closest vote of any of the conciliar documents. Go through all the other ones. The vote totals are in the area of like 2,450 to 5, or to 7, or to 3. My point is, Unless we think the Holy Spirit just took a vacation from 1962 to 1965, and unless um, we reject our theology that the Spirit guides ecumenical councils, I think we have to say that he spoke pretty clearly. In the victory of those who were advocating this, call it, you know, new evangelization approach. Now, again, this is Tracy Rowland and others. The victorious party at Vatican II, rather shortly after the council, split. And I've already alluded a couple times to the concilium communio split. So a more liberal side associated with concilium, think here of Karl Rahner, Hans Kung, Edward Skilebex, Gregory Baum, many others. They were very much in the ascendancy, by the way, when I was coming of age and going through school. Splitting off from concilium were the communio thinkers. Now, who comes to mind? Well, I've mentioned a lot of them. Ratzinger, Wojtyla, Baltazar, Delubak. Now, here's the interesting question. Where would you situate Pope Francis? If you look at those three camps, the kind of preconciliar neo-Thomist, the Catholic liberal, more concilium camp, the communio camp, where would you uh, uh, place Pope Francis? Well, in recent years, there's been a lot of interesting work done on the Pope's intellectual formation. They invited me a couple years ago to be part of a, um, of a conference on this. And I had the privilege of writing one of the papers. And um, very instructive, very instructive when you look into this. Because I think the answer emerges very clearly. Pope Francis is not with the sort of neo-Thomas, neo-scholastic, preconciliar uh, Gary Goudagrange school. That seems pretty clear. By the same token, he's not in the school of the concilium Catholic liberals, it seems to me. Rather, who are the people that shaped him? Henri de Lubac. Now, mind you, Bergoglio, a young Jesuit, de Lubac, one of the leading Jesuit scholars mid 20th century. But also, and here's the man I did some research on, a close colleague, intellectual ally of de Lubac, Gaston Fassard. The young Bergoglio is very careful student of Gaston Fassard. From those two figures, by the way, he gets the idea of the church as the place where contraries are reconciled. Think of de Lubac's book published by Ignatius Press, Paradoxes. Well, read Fassar and de Lubac, that comes very much into Bergoglio's thinking. Who else comes to mind? 
Romano Guardini, one of the great figures in that, in that communio school, influenced Baltazar, influenced Wojtyla, influenced Ratzinger. Well, Bergoglio commences his doctoral work by looking at the writings of Romano Guardini. Read Laudato Si again, but with Guardini in mind. Guardini writes a text in about 1920 called Letters from Lake Como, in which he decries the emergence of a sort of aggressive uh, technocracy, a sort of aggressive, uh, nature-defying technocracy. Read those texts from 1920, from Guardini, and now look at Laudato Si. It's not so much, you know, uh, trendy uh, 21st century. It's very much 1920s Guardini. One more, Baltazar, Baltazar. Look through Bergoglio's writings, both pre and, and post papal election, and you're going to find a stress on the via pulchritudinis, the way of beauty. Where did he get that? But from Baltazar. De Lubac, Fissa, Guardini, Baltazar, the great communio figures were the ones who had the greatest impact, it seems to me, intellectually on Pope Francis. Now, bringing this together. Catholics have been arguing with each other from the beginning. I mean, that's par for the course. I mean, that, nothing wrong with that in itself. From the Council of Jerusalem on, we've been arguing with each other. In a way, that's how the, the program goes forward. Think of the great scholastic theologians debating with each other. But there are limits to a healthy conversation. One sign that we have um, lost our way the descent into vitriol and conspiracy theories seems to me is a sign that, that the conversation has become dysfunctional. But two other clear indicators, friends, two clear indicators that a Catholic conversation has become dysfunctional is a disparagement of a pope, the successor of Peter, and the questioning of the legitimacy of an ecumenical council. What's on my heart right now is that there are too many voices in the church who are articulating those points of view. I'm all in favor of a, of a lively uh, conversation, but that's not the way to do it. I think what we need to do is not reopen Vatican II, not revisit Vatican II. That's that old teaching. Rather, it's time, and it's, it's been time for the past 60 years, for us to get on with the great work of Vatican II, bringing the lumen to the gentes, letting the life out, evangelizing the world. And God bless all of you.